Hello everybody, welcome to the first uh, Neurosense Twilight session. My name is Matt Slocum, I'm uh, part of the Neurosense team at the Centre for Educational Neuroscience and I'll be guiding you through some of the activities that we'll be uh, going through today. So I'll just start by telling you a little bit about the Neurosense project. So Neurosense is a research project um, uh, at the Centre for Educational Neuroscience and also with our partners at NASEN, uh, the National Association for Special Educational Needs. And the aim of the project is to um, investigate uh, the prevalence of uh, neuromyths in special educational needs and developmental disorders. Um, we're also interested in understanding the impact of these on children, teachers and education, and we'll be building a awareness campaign based around this. Um, so this event is part of a, a larger series of activities we'll be doing. We've got a couple of focus groups coming up and um, we'll be producing some uh, materials and having a, a, another uh, online event based around that as well. However, the, um, the aim of this, this first event is very much about catalyzing a conversation around um, neuromyths in special educational needs um, and starting to think about how um, these are affecting um, children, the first steps. So if you could move to the next slide, Michael. So today we're going to have uh, we're going to start with two talks. Um, the first talk is by Michael Thomas. Uh, Michael is um, a neuroscientist at Birkbeck University, and he's going to be discussing um, educational neuroscience and its relevance to developmental disorders. Our second talk is going to be by Joe Van Herwegen. Joe is a developmental psychologist at the UCL Edu uh, Institute of Education, and Joe has been conducting the scoping study. Uh, looking at prevalence of neuromyths in uh, special educational needs. And then after that, we're going to um, move on to a panel discussion where we're going to explore some of the questions and themes that have been raised in these presentations. So joining Joe and Michael on the panel is going to be uh, Amelia Roberts. Amelia is the uh, Deputy Director at the Centre for Inclusive Education at the UCL Institute of Education. Uh, Vegeta Patel, who is the Principal of Swiss Cottage School, a special educational needs school and Jules Dolby, who is the head of Key Stage 3 and uh, English at Dorset Special School. And then after that, we're going to have some time for audience uh, questions as well. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, Michael. So we really want this to be an interactive session. Um, we'll be conducting several polls throughout uh, today's session, the first of which is going to be um, after this introduction, and then we'll do one after the panel discussion and then one at the end as well. Um, if you'd like to chat at all during uh, the presentations uh, and panel discussion, please use the, the chat function. If you go to the, if you uh, move your mouse or uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should see this, this uh, chat box. If you click on that, and then you can discuss um, with other people during, during the presentations. Um, just to let you know, we won't be taking any questions from the chat. So if you'd like to ask a question to the panel at all, um, if you use this Q&A function at the bottom here, if you click on that, and then um, you can add any questions you'd like to add to uh, ask to the panel members. Uh, if it's a question that's for a specific panel member, if you could make that clear, that would be really helpful for us. Um, we've got a fairly large audience today, but we'll try and get through as many of these as, as possible. Um, after this, this particular session, we're gonna be holding some focus groups as well. And so we're really interested in speaking to um, teachers, SENCOs, um, uh, LSAs and TAs to get their ideas about how we can kind of start developing some of these materials um, to raise awareness of, of neuromyths. So we'll send some information out um, by email after this. So if you're interested in those, in um, taking part in those, um, please uh, do get in contact us with, when we send the email over. And um, lastly, if you'd like to talk about this on Twitter at all, you can use the, the Neurosense um, hashtag. Uh, we encourage you to do so. Um, Part of this, this, this uh, event is about raising awareness of these um, neuromyths. Um, so feel free to take screenshots, quotes, those kind of things, and we'd be very grateful for that. And uh, one final bit of housekeeping is we'll be recording this session, and we'll put the recordings on the Center for Educational Neuroscience website, and we'll send a link around to the recordings to everybody who's registered as well. Okay, so now it's time for our first poll. So I'm gonna uh, open up this poll, first of all, if you could, um quickly give your views on this we'll, we'll leave it up for uh poll one relaunch polling excuse me right okay uh, if you'd like to uh 
respond to this poll. Uh, we really want to hear what you've got to say on these matters, and then um, we'll move on to our first presentations. So. We'll just leave that up for a minute and then we'll move on. So some of these polls are about kind of informing um, some of the work that we're going to be doing later. Uh, and then some are kind of more to facilitate discussion in this. So we'll, we'll, we'll be showing you some of the later polls, but probably not some. Okay, so. Okay, so we'll just leave that up for a few seconds more. This is exciting. Okay. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on to our first presentations now. So um, I'll just end that polling and down there. So we've got two talks now. Um, I'll introduce both of our speakers first because uh, Michael will then be handing over to Joe. So our first speaker is uh, Michael Thomas. Uh, Michael is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at uh, Birkbeck University of London. He's also the Director of the Centre for Educational Neuroscience. His research is focused on understanding um, the causes and nature of cognitive variability. So that is why children become cleverer as they get older and uh, why children of the same age can differ in their abilities and what causes these uh, extremes of variation such as gifted, giftedness and developmental disorders. Um, his work at the Centre for Educational Neuroscience aims to bring together neuroscience, child development, psychology and education research with the aim of establishing a dialogue between researchers and teachers to further the translation of research into, into practice and improve education and well-being across the lifespan. Um, so after Michael, um, we will have our second speaker, Joe. Joe Van Herwegen is Associate Professor of Psychology at the UCL Institute of Education, and she's a director of the Child Development and Learning Difficulties Lab. Joe's work aims to understand the complexity of development, especially the impact of environmental factors such as educational practice, um, education policies and home environment on uh, different aspects of development, including uh, number and language development. She used uh, a variety of methods, including cross syndrome methods and individual difference uh, studies. And she's also interested in understanding how research in developmental disorders can be used to inform teaching practice and improve pedagogy for children with special educational needs. So, um, Michael, if you're ready to start, I'll hand over to you and um, We'll start with our first talk. Thank you. I am Matt. Thank you very much for that introduction and thanks to everybody for uh, joining us for this evening's session. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, try and cover four points. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to try and explain what educational neuroscience is. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to, to thinking a little bit about um, what uh, basic research on neurodevelopmental disorders is and, and how it might in principle be useful uh, for informing educational practices. Um, and then I'm going to have a look at, well, what is the current pedagogy around special educational needs in the UK? Uh, and after that introduction, I'm, I'm going to set things up uh, for Joe. I'm going to uh, explain what neuromyths are uh, and uh, uh, why we think sometimes they're good things, sometimes bad things. And, and then I'm, I'm going to hand over to Joe uh, to talk about the specific project we've been doing uh, around neuromyths and special educational needs. Okay, so let's get going. What is educational neuroscience? Well, it's a relatively new discipline, part of the, the, uh, the science, the new science of, of learning. Educational neuroscience is a, essentially a cross-disciplinary enterprise, bringing together researchers from psychology, from education, but also more, more recent insights that have come from neuroscience about mechanisms of learning, and what we're beginning to understand from machine learning, from getting computers to learn about uh, what it means to learn and what the, what the challenges are. 
So as Matt said, I'm, I'm the director of the uh, University of London Centre for Educational Neuroscience. Uh, this centre was set up in 2008 and it brought together researchers uh, from several different uh, institutes from uh, University College London, the neuroscientists there, uh, the education experts from uh, the UCL Institute of Education and experts in child development from uh, Birkbeck. And I'll go really as to, as to put together all our expertise and, and try and find out whether the research insights that we're getting about mechanisms of learning could be uh, translated into a form that's useful uh, to educators uh, to use in the classroom. Of course, we're not naive to think that, that learning and mechanisms of learning is all there is to education. Uh, so if you look at this, this diagram, this is uh, trying to get across the idea of nested constraints. If we have in the middle of this diagram, the idea of learning outcomes, uh, what constraints are there in, in learning outcomes? Well, there are certainly factors to do with the child, to do with the child's uh, ability, their motivation and attention, health factors, nutrition, and mechanisms of learning educational neuroscience is really about these kind of child factors in the middle. Of course, these are nested uh, within school factors, things like school policy, teacher skill, classroom environment and teaching materials. And those are nested into wider societal and family factors such as uh, cultural influences, socioeconomic status uh, and the, the kind of technology e ecology uh, in our country. And those still are nested in wider constraints uh, to do with government factors about uh, how the government sets the budget for education, what the education policy is, and the national curriculum, and so forth. So uh, educational neuroscience, the idea of putting together different disciplines, is all about dialogue. It's all about getting different parties to talk to each other, uh, and uh, the, the researchers can think about, well, what they've discovered, how in principle might that be useful to, to educators, how might it turn into useful practices in the classroom? But also it's, it's a case of educators directing researchers uh, about where they should be doing their current research, what are the current challenges in the education system and in the classroom. And we tend to think of there being in, in the, the subcomponents of educational neuroscience, two kinds of routes. There can be this indirect route uh, and, and probably most of the, of the translation is here where as we understand more about mechanisms of learning in the brain, for example, what sleep does, what stress does to learning, uh, we can think about how that alters our theories of learning within psychology and then those are kind of translated into an educational context. But we also think in terms of a direct route, if we think about the brain in terms of it being a biological organ, how uh, what, what conditions we can put the biological organ in for the best outcome in learning. So then we're thinking about factors like diet uh, and sleep and, and exercise and so forth. So let's move on to think about uh, basic neuroscience on neurodevelopmental disorders. There is, uh, believe it or not, a huge body of basic research out there uh, increasing over the last 30 years. If you go to your bookshop or onto Amazon, you will find all these sorts of volumes out there. Uh, detailing the latest research in developmental disorders. What kinds of things do they focus on? Well, they sort of try and identify the different behavioral profiles you, you see showing different patterns of strengths and weaknesses, maybe identify the particular genetic syndromes where, where we understand a specific mutation has caused a given kind of uh, cognitive profile. Researchers will identify subtypes, dimensions of variability, uh, variability. Uh, comorbidity, that's the kind of disorders that seem to co-occur with each other and, and typically when, when you'll see the onset of different disorders. And of course, researchers are very interested in mechanism. They're interested in cause. So a lot of what they're doing is trying to understand what might be the genetic contribution to different disorders. We know, for example, that uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or, or dyslexia tend to run to some extent in families, but also the environmental factors that, that increase risk uh, of developing different disorders. And researchers might identify like the best behavioral or, or clinical biomarkers used to diagnose disorders, to identify them and, and to, to look at uh, the prognosis. Sorts of things you might come across that researchers have revealed, and maybe in dyslexia, that, that even though children with dyslexia vary a lot, what seems common across them 
is a core deficit in phonology and in processing speech sounds, or that in autistic spectrum disorder, one of the principal markers is uh, struggling to reason about other people's mental states. Or for instance, in genetic syndromes that children with Williams syndrome, that's one of the rare genetic disorders, they appear very sociable on the surface, but that masks some underlying anxiety around interacting with other people. So we think about translating that kind of basic research in, into uh, uh, recommendations or practices that might be useful in the classroom. How might that work? Most of the translation has tended to take place in clinical settings and around diagnosis. Most of it is focused on uh, literacy, language and numeracy. But it might be useful to think about the possibilities. How might we do more than that in, in translation? Well, let's say you have a child in the classroom who, who is exhibiting various different kinds of difficulties, maybe to do with attention or visual spatial skills or perceptual sensitivity. How, how might research be uh, interesting or useful to the teacher? Well, it might help teachers understand the characteristic profiles of different disorders, uh, the kind of commonalities that you see with a child who's been assigned a given label, but also how they might differ. Uh, patterns of developmental change, how, how the severity of symptoms might be expected to alter over time. And of course, pointing to the evidence base about uh, the kinds of techniques that might be useful for improving learning outcomes uh, for children with different kinds of disorders. So let's just review what the current pedagogy in the UK is for uh, teaching in uh, special educational needs. Well, uh, turns around there isn't one. So uh, that's because uh, the pedagogy for SEN is, is subsumed under the broader notion of differentiation and individualization. So I'm just putting up the example of a research paper here that, that does work in this kind of area. The idea is that teaching practices should be tailored to the individual child uh, and uh, doesn't matter whether they have differences within the normal range or outside the normal range that it should be about that individual child. And we also know that, that a child that's been assigned a given diagnostic label for having, say, developmental coordination disorder or dyslexia or dyspraxia or ADHD, that these children can vary a lot anyway. So, so is there a need to try and teach to, to that label? Or, or maybe you should be just focusing on, on the individual child, in which case there's not a need for a specific SEN pedagogy. This uh, was a report uh, commissioned by the Department for Education um, on teaching strategies and uh, approaches for pupils with special educational needs prepared by Davis and Florian. You'll see 2004, it's quite an old report and, and one of our short term of objectives in the Center for Educational Neurosciences is, is to try and go back to the, the uh, basic research and update this report. This, this is a, this table summarizing uh, the report of what they did was to identify the different common difficulties in the classroom and appropriate teaching strategies according to the research. So for instance, uh, if the difficulty is communication interaction, they recommended that these children would benefit from mainstream education, but also uh, additional support mechanisms. Let's say the difficulty is behavioral and emotional and social development. For these children, you can use the peers for uh, behavioral management in, in peer monitoring or also an intervention in uh, a buddy system. So I won't go through all of this just to show you this is the kind of work that's been done. I will pull a few quotes out of this report which I think are interesting. So uh, the authors Davis and Florian said the teaching approaches and strategies identified in this review were not sufficiently differentiated from those which are used to teach all children to justify a distinct SEN pedagogy. They say, in fact, there's little evidence for distinctive teaching approaches for children with specific learning difficulties. But they say the important thing uh, is to respond to individual differences. So the key uh, to appropriate teaching lies in careful and ongoing assessment linked to teaching. And indeed, they stress there's no sort of magic bullet, one technique that's going to work perfectly for everyone. Instead, they say a combination of strategies produces more powerful effects than a single strategy solution. That is, they recommend a multi-method approach. They, they do point to a couple of caveats though. They say when they looked at the research, they found most of it is on younger children where there's strong evidence in support of early intervention across all areas of need. 
And then they say, with the exception of social and emotional development and research on self-determination, relatively few studies focused on older learners with special educational needs. I think that's, that's interesting. And also perhaps most important for us, uh, they say little research takes account of the diversity of contexts in which strategies need to be applied. So I think this is an opportunity that, that if teachers can understand from basic researchers uh, why certain strategies tend to work with certain types of children in response to the difficulties that those children have, it might empower teachers to be better able to adapt those uh, strategies for different contexts and different kinds of children. Okay, so on to the main topic for uh, this evening session, neuromyths. What are neuromyths? Well, basically they are a misunderstanding of science about the brain. They get to be called myths because they are often widespread in the public. Uh, but if they, they're prevalent in educators, there is the risk that they'll lead to teaching practices which don't actually have uh, an evidence base. So the kind of examples you'd probably have come across, we only use 10% of our brain. Maybe that's true in Hollywood movies, but not true in reality. Uh, another one, there are left brain thinkers and right brain thinkers. Yes, we have two hemispheres in our brain, but different people don't use different sides. We all use both sides of our brain to think. Uh, children learn better if you teach according to their preferred learning styles. It's true children, if you ask them or say they, they prefer material in a different kind of modality, no evidence at all that they learn better if you present material in that given uh, modality. So if I give talks about educational neuroscience, I do tend to make uh, kind of two public health warnings. First of all, don't be impressed by brain images. They look very kind of scientific and so forth, uh, but uh, um, they don't do anything on, on their own and don't believe in neuromyths. So if educational neuroscience is about anything, it's about improving learning outcomes for children and trying to see how basic research can be translated in a form uh, that can support teachers in the classroom. I'm a little bit ambivalent about neuromyths. Sometimes I think they're a good thing because they do show that educators and the general public are interested in the brain. As an educational neuroscientist, I think that's good. Uh, and also um, they imply that educators think an understanding of mechanism of how learning works is probably going to be relevant to their practice. Of course, they're also bad in the sense that they are an example of poor science communication, bad because potentially they can lead to activities in the classroom that have no basis in the fact. In fact, uh, Joe will probably mention that there is limited evidence that's actually sought to link uh, our possession of neuromyths or believing in neuromyths to, to teaching quality. Uh, probably there's a, a more research to be done there, but also bad because they can drown out the real research that's going on. Neuromyths tend to get exaggerated media coverage because they're a bit kind of clickbaity. Everything you thought you knew is wrong. That sort of implication that oh, scientists don't really know anything. So at, at the Center for Education and Neuroscience, we have done a little bit of work uh, around dispelling neuromyths. If you go to our webpage, we prepared a a big long list of common neuromyths and we looked at the evidence on, on uh, each of them about whether the evidence supported things like fish oil improving learning uh, and so forth. Uh, but as part of that, uh, moving on to uh, uh, Joe's talk, we had did launch an exercise, uh, as we say here, a project called Neurosense to explore people's beliefs about the brain and people with special educational needs and we launched a survey which actually is still open. So if you're interested in completing the survey, uh, we'll, we'll stick up this link in the chat and you can uh, go complete the survey. And Joe's gonna talk about uh, the results of that survey. So um, I'm going to hand over to her and many thanks for your attention. Thanks very, <clears throat> well, thanks very much, Michael. Let me just get my presentation up and I hope everybody can see this. And let me just do this. So thank you. Um, the work I'm presenting today is around indeed the survey. So this is neuromyths about neurodevelopmental disorders or special educational needs, talking around some of the misconceptions that are endorsed by educators and the general public. And this work was conducted with uh, a master's student, Sylvia Gini, as well as colleagues from the Center of Educational Neuroscience, Victoria Nolan, and then Michael and myself. <clears throat> 
So um, the reason, as Michael already mentioned, is that we look around um, neurodevelopmental disorders because it's an under-research under area, um, but also because there might be a risk here around these misconceptions about the brain leading to some kind of forms of stigma. So for example, um, later on I'll discuss one of the neuromyths related to dyslexia is the idea that children with dyslexia might uh, see are more prone to letter reversals and reversing B for D and D for B, for example. However, research has shown that this is not necessarily the case and that children with dyslexia don't, in, uh, don't see letter reversals more than uh, neurotypically developing children. Uh, however, if educators believe this kind of neuromit, um, they're more likely not to refer children with uh, dyslexia for a formal diagnosis when they do not show this kind of letter reversal uh, difficulties. So although we are not quite sure yet around how uh, neuromits um, relate to educational practice, we do know that it could relate to some forms of stigma and later on it will become clear when we talk about some of the neuromits related to autism. Um, so also we're interested in these uh, neuromids because, uh, as Mike already uh, mentioned, um, these could inform us around where awareness campaigns should focus on uh, in terms of relieving stigma. So the neurodevelopmental disorders that we looked at um, are those that are most prevalent within the UK. So the first one is autism spectrum disorders, which affect around 1% of the population. Um, as far as we're aware, there's only a, a few studies that have looked at neuromits in this group, uh, especially one of them by John et al. 2017. I included a focus group discussion with 37 participants, which reveals that commonly there are seven neuromits uh, related to ASD, and I've listed them for you here on the right hand side. And that's what you'll see from this list is that most of the neuromits that are endorsed relate to the social dimension of the disorder. For example, uh, the belief that um, people with autism or autistic individuals are disinterested in social relationships or may not like to be touched or are likely to be introverts. Um, one important aspect of this study, though, is the fact that um, these were mainly undergraduate and postgraduate students who took part in these focus groups, and not all of them had experience with uh, autism. Uh, another developmental disorder that we uh, are examining is ADHD, because again, it's very prevalent uh, within the classroom. So about 1.4% uh, of children in the UK have a diagnosis for ADHD. And again, there's uh, a, only a handful of studies that have looked at um, the endorsement of neuromits related to ADHD. This was a study by West et al. in 2005 that included 256 teachers as well as some parents of children with ADHD. They didn't just look at neuromits, but actually looked at around what, uh, what facts people knew around ADHD using the knowledge of uh, ADHD questionnaire. So they looked at causes of ADHD, characteristics that children may show, as well as any treatment options. Um, what this study showed was that um, scores on the treatment scales were the lowest for both groups, but in general, parents had a higher knowledge around facts related to ADHD compared to the educators. Um, some of the myths related to um, the treatment of ADHD related to, for example, special diets are an effective treatment for ADHD, so reducing sugar or having an additive free uh, diet um, that was endorsed by about 34% of the participants in the study. Um, or alternatively, ADHD can be treated effectively by structuring a child's environment and having a routine. And that is true, um, but was only endorsed by 30% of the participants. So again, we see that there is not enough knowledge around what works for children with ADHD and what does not. Another uh, developmental disorder we included in our study is dyslexia, which is again of the prevalence, so one in 10 people in the UK have a diagnosis of dyslexia. And um, there are two studies as far as we're aware that have directly examined um, the prevalence of uh, neuromits for dyslexia. Um, one of the common uh, neuromits, as I mentioned before, is that children with dyslexia see letters backwards, and that is uh, in a study by McDonald's et al, endorsed by one in two people. Um, other um, 
<clears throat> myths that were endorsed, for example, include the fact that 91% of UK teachers believe dyslexia to be at least partly due to a deficit in visual perception, so the eye is not working well, um, or 97% of teachers uh, believe that children can outgrow their dyslexia as they get older and that they become better at reading, whereas uh, research shows that um, dyslexia is a lifelong developmental disorder, even though children indeed may improve in their reading abilities. Finally, we looked at uh, one of the most uh, common genetic disorders, and that is Down syndrome, which occurs around one in a thousand live births. Um, and neuromyths related to Down syndrome often relate to uh, what they can learn. <clears throat> so for example, what a child uh, with learning difficulties, in this case Down syndrome, can understand can be measured by what uh, the child can say, uh, which is of not the case uh, for many children with learning difficulties, but especially not for children with Down syndrome, who show an uneven cognitive profile where they have uh, larger impairments in their speech compared into their um, overall language abilities. Um, another um, common belief that is endorsed is that individuals with learning disabilities, like for example Down syndrome, um, have smaller brains. Um, and again, <clears throat> research has shown that although um, people with neurodevelopmental disorders often have different brain structures and the entire brain is differently wired and, and, and differently weighted, um, there are no differences in terms of the size of the brain overall. So. Um, as previous studies had focused uh, on one particular disorder, in this case, we looked at all of these different neurodevelopmental disorders, and we compared the endorsement of uh, neurodevelop uh, neuromyths related to the general brain compared to those related to neurodevelopmental neuromyths. And also we uh, compared um, the, how these beliefs were endorsed by educators compared to the general public. And finally, in, examine some factors um, that we uh, thought or knew from previous uh, research that may impact on um, the endorsement of uh, certain beliefs. So in terms of our predictions, we predicted that all groups would endorse some neuromyths, um, not only because that has been shown in previous studies when it comes to um, the general neuromyths, but also because for neurodevelopmental disorders, the evidence isn't yet always that clear cut yet. Uh, we also compared the beliefs of mainstream class teachers to those with general public and um, hypothesized or predicted that teachers would endorse fewer neuromyths in general compared to the general public. And um, seeing that um, most uh, teachers have some training related to um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, also, we looked at uh, the familiarity of the disorder and predicted that those who are familiar with the disorder would indeed endorse fewer um, neuromyths or have fewer incorrect beliefs. And then finally, uh, we know from uh, previous studies that an interest in the brain um, can actually impact on endorsement of neuromyths. And indeed, some studies have shown that endorsement of or looking um, being interested in the brain and accessing information about the brain can actually result in endorsing more neuromyths or having more incorrect beliefs. So in terms of our participants, we had 569 participants that completed the survey and 203 of those uh, are educators or are people who work in education compared to 366 uh, participants from the general public. Um, as you can see from this table, in terms of uh, participants having a formal disability diagnosis themselves, there isn't any difference between those in education and the general public. Uh, also, if we look at having a child with a learning disability themselves, again, we see no difference between those in education uh, and those uh, members of the general public. However, what we do see when we look at the highest level of education, we see that those who work within education had higher levels of education overall compared to our participants from the general public. Um, and that's what was leading around our prediction that uh, those in education would endorse fewer neuromyths. In terms of when we look at um, participants um, who worked in education, we can see that they completed ver various roles within the school. So we had 44% of the participants that were teachers, 14% uh, were TAs or LSAs, uh, a small percentage were SENCOs, 
And then we have a wide uh, a number of uh, participants who fulfilled other roles within the school in terms of head teachers, but also administrative staff, and also a large proportion of um, other edu uh, educational roles, such as uh, higher education staff and educational psychologists. So a very varied uh, sample when we talk about uh, those working in education. It's important to keep that in mind. In terms of our survey, we had four sections. So the first section covered the general knowledge, um, uh, so the general neuromits. In the second section, participants completed questions related to um, neuromits related to neurodevelopmental disorders. Then we had a section around demographics. So in terms of, you know, which type of school did they teach at and how often did they um, access information about the brain. And then our final section, which we haven't analyzed yet, we looked at, you know, what kind of teaching methods um, do the educators only, of, of course, um, use in their daily practice. So um, in terms of the general neuromits, uh, we use those that have been frequently used in previous research. So these are 15 true and false statements about the brain and participants rated these statements on a four point Likert scale going from true, probably true, probably false and false. And similarly, we have 30 statements uh, around neurodevelopmental neuromits. Um, and these were taken from the previous studies that I've mentioned uh, in our introduction, including uh, neuromits related to ASD, ADHD, Down syndrome, dyslexia, as well as some general neuromits that would apply to all of these groups. And again, these were rated on a four point Likert scale. So here are just an overview of our 15 um, statements about the general brain. I'm just going to um, point a few out. So one of them that Michael already introduces the fact that we only use 10% of our brain, for example, that's false. Uh, and also the fact that the left and right hemisphere of the brain always work together. So that's a true statement. In terms of uh, neurodevelopmental neuromits, we had statements such as dyslexia can be helped by using colored lenses or colored overlays, uh, which has been shown to not be the case for, for all children, or um, that uh, children with autism are unable to notice social rejection. As, as I already mentioned, this is a common uh, neuromyth for autism. Or children who are dyslexic tend to have lower IQs than those who are not dyslexic, which is obviously uh, also not the, not the case, even though they may have reading difficulties, there's no difficulties or overall uh, intellectual difficulties. Um, and another common neuromyth is reducing dietary, in, uh, dietary intake of sugar or food additives is generally effective in reducing the symptoms of ADHD. So these are just a few um, of the statements we've used. <clears throat> So what about our results? So if we look at the number, th this slide shows the uh, overall correct uh, response or correct uh, statements. Um, so as we can see here, for neuro, uh, general neuromids, people who worked in education had a score of 3.23, and those who did not work in education had a score of 3.21. There's no significant difference between those two groups. Similarly, when we look at uh, neuromids related to SEN or developmental disorders, we see again that there is no difference between those who worked in education and those who do not. However, as you can see from the previous uh, uh, slide here, um, what we see is that there's a difference for the neuromit type in terms of that participants were more likely to get um, statements correct around the general brain compared to statements that related to neurodevelopmental disorders. And there was no difference what, in what kind of type of uh, work they did, so whether they worked in education or um, part of the general public, and no interaction between those two. So what kind of uh, neuromits were, or facts were incorrectly classified? So facts that were incorrectly classified were things like um, dyslexia can be helped by using colored lenses. Again, we knew that that was going to be a popular one. Uh, this is true, but was uh, most incorrectly answered by those in education as well as those from the general public. Another one uh, that was frequently endorsed was the fact that the multi-sensory approach, so supporting children with uh, oral information, with visual information, to learning is always better than it's probably false because for some children giving them the uh, multi-sensory approach might cause an overload of information and again this was endorsed by both those in education as well as the general public 
Uh, another one is the fact that all children with hearing impairments benefit from visual information, which is again also probably false for the same reason. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, a popular one is reducing dietary intake of sugar or food additives is generally effective in reducing the symptoms of ADHD. And again, we find this in the top five for those in education as well as the general public yet again. And finally, uh, also looking at dyslexia is caused by visual problems. I think what is interesting looking at these uh, neuromids is that they do not um, just um, look not related to one particular neurodevelopmental disorder, but what we do see is that a lot of these relate to what works for children with neurodevelopmental disorders in terms of treatments. When we look at you know, those that were most correctly classified in both groups, there is a little bit more difference between the two groups of those in education and the general public. But again, we see some overlap, um, especially the fact like you know, autism only occurs in boys. Um, most people, uh, almost 95% in both groups, correctly uh, identified this to be a false statement. Um, also, as well as children with Down syndrome cannot understand what their reading was, another one that was um, correctly identified to be false in both groups. In terms of looking at what kind of um, information or what kind of factors may play a role in whether or not people correctly or incorrectly identified a factor around the brain, uh, when we look at people working within education, what we see is that how often they access information about a brain was a good predictor for whether or not they were going to have the statement classified as correctly. However, other factors like a familiarity or type of neuromyth or an interaction between them does not matter. So this is an important factor both for endorsing um, facts around the general brain as well as facts related to neurodevelopmental disorders. Similarly, for the, sim for the general public, we see that again, how often people access information about the brain is a good predictor for how likely they are to have a statement correctly or incorrectly. Again, both for whether this statement relates to general brain facts or facts related to neurodevelopmental disorders. However, in this case, we also see that familiarity with developmental disorders is an important factor. We also looked a little bit more into detail as to, you know, are there any differences between whether people um, endorse neuromids related to certain neurodevelopmental disorders, even though familiarity wasn't really important. What we do see though, is that um, compared to all the groups, we can see here the blue dots are the average scores, and this is the black dots are the spread. And as you can see, participants were more likely to get statements correct related to autism compared to the other uh, neurodevelopmental groups. And this was the case for those working in education. And we see a very similar pattern um, for responses for the general population, again, with people having more likely statements correct when these statements related to autism. So in terms of what our findings, what this means is that, as we mentioned, there is no significant difference between um, people working in education and compared to the general population, even though in our sample, um, the people who worked in education at higher levels of education in general. Um, and this goes against our, our prediction. Um, However, very interestingly, is that what we found is that um, general neuromids were less endorsed compared to previous studies. So in previous studies, you know, people had um, a, a average correct scores for statements between 65 and 75, depending on the study you look like. In our study, participants correctly identified facts about the brain in about 85% of the time. And what we think this means is that there might be uh, an, an impact of um, awareness initiatives that have been uh, done in the past, um, including the one that Michael Thomas described from the Center of Educational Neuroscience. Um, and especially this, the reason why we think this is the case, because we know that how often people um, access the information about the brain uh, was a good predictor for whether or not they uh, were going to endorse facts correctly or not. Um, what we also see is that knowledge about the general brain was better than knowledge around neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so that, that shows that there's a little bit more work for us to do there. Um, however, again, it might 
awareness campaigns might be beneficial here, because one of the things we found was that um, facts were more likely to be endorsed correctly for autism compared to some of the other neurodevelopmental groups. And we know in the last few years, there's been a number of awareness campaigns that have been raised related to autism, as well as the Autism Act 2009 and other uh, various lobbying groups that have been raised. Um, and finally, we know that those who accessed information about the brain did better in both groups, as I mentioned before, and that's obviously a good thing for us because it seems to suggest that if we can get people to access more uh, facts or provide them with the facts, that we might be able to reduce some of these neuromyths. Of course, every study has its limitations and ours is not an exclusion from that. Um, one of the things we'd hoped is that we got a, a lot more SENCOs to respond to our survey, because obviously SENCOs may have a lot more detailed information about neurodevelopmental disorders and especially treatments. Unfortunately, in our sample, only 6% of them uh, were SENCOs. So we hope that's why we kept the survey open, that uh, some people can still complete it. We also know, as I mentioned before, our sample was very varied and there are different routes to teaching. And obviously within these different routes, teachers may have more information or less information around neurodevelopmental disorders or around the brain in general. So we will uh, we be conducting a finer grained analysis um, to, to examine this uh, further. Um, although we know that accessing the brain uh, in general uh, was, was a good predictor for whether or not people uh, endorsed facts, we don't know what kind of information um, our respondents were actually accessing. Um, and the impact is, as we discussed, it's still not clear around whether the endorsement of myths actually impact on practice and educational outcomes of these children. Um, there have been some studies that, at least one study has suggested that um, it might lead to stigma and it might lead to reduced outcomes um, because people might not believe what the true capacities are of people with um, neurodevelopmental disorders. On the other hand, if uh, other studies have shown that there is absolutely no relationship between endorsement of these myths and um, practice. But um, the study that showed this only looked at whether teachers who had won awards believed more, endorsed more neuromyths or not, but not really looked at what is happening in practice on the ground itself. So in our next step that we'd like to explore with you is, you know, do these myths impact on teaching and learning and how can they best be addressed? So thank you very much and I hand back to Max. And thanks Joe uh, and Michael for those uh, fascinating um, presentations. So can I uh, invite the rest of our panel to turn their cameras on now and um, we're going to be moving on to the next stage in, in this evening's um, activity. So I'm just going to introduce our panel first of all. So um, I'd like to introduce Amelia Roberts. First, Amelia is going to be the discussant for our panel, who's going to facilitate the um, discussion. Uh, Amelia is the Deputy Director of the Centre for Inclusive Education at the UCL in uh, Institute of Education. And her work there includes working internationally and um, with UK local authorities and school alliances to uh, improve attainment and participation of pupils with special educational needs. Um, she's also the joint programme leader of um, SEN course at the UCL Institute of Education and leads a knowledge exchange programme for social, emotional and mental health. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce Vegeta as well. Vegeta Patel is um, Principal of Swiss, Swiss Cottage School Development and Research Centre, um, which is a special needs school for children aged 2 to 19 in Camden. Uh, the school is designated as a national teaching school and it leads an alliance of schools, organisations and higher education partners to provide teacher training and support school improvement for um, special educational needs across the region and across country as well, sorry. She's also a national leader of education and supports head, head teachers, senior and middle leaders and SENCOs um, in uh, developing their support for children with special educational needs and has contributed to the development of programs for teacher training and leadership development. Um, I'd like to also introduce Jules Dolby, who is our other panel member. Uh, Jules is head of Key Stage 3 in English at Dorset Special School and is an experienced inclusion, literacy and assistive technology specialist. She has worked in education for over 20 years as a, teach in, as a teacher and in strategic and advisory roles. Um, she is a national leader for the Wom at Woman Ed and at Woman Ed Tech um, uh, organisations, both of which have been set up to support um, exist aspiring women leaders in education and technology. 
She also campaigns for the prevention of exclusionary practices in education and is committed to inclusive and comp uh, comprehensive education. So um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Amelia. And if you'd like to, I know we had some questions bubbling away for the panel. Um, yes, lovely. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I'm going to start by asking the panel, were there any surprises in what you've heard tonight? So thinking about the work that you've done with teachers and the types of neuromyths that you would have come across, were there any, um, um, anything that was particularly reinforced for you by the research and anything that surprised you in the research? Shall I start? I'm happy to. Um, yes. hello, hello there. Um, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I'd certainly, I've, I've heard most of those myths <laughs> and as a dyslexia specialist as well, um, the visual one is, is a big one. Um, so yeah, so, so they didn't surprise me. Um, I was interested by the multi-sensory one actually, because I slightly disagree with the, with the um, discussion on that, because I don't think multi-sensory has to be over-sensory. Multi-sensory just means that you write it, you speak it, you say it, you know, and that can be done in a very calm way. So I, I, that one surprised me because I'm constantly telling teachers to use lots of, lots of ways of doing multi-sensory rather than just going down a visual route or a, or a kinesthetic route. So, so I think they're the two that, that um, stuck out for me. Thank you. It's an interesting one. I was thinking about um, having key words stuck on the wall for children with dyslexia. So that would be, to me, would be an example of multisensory. So yeah. um, that I would still consider to be really useful. So perhaps yeah. there's yeah. some work to be done in exploring what we yeah. mean by multisensory in the context in which we might be. Yeah. And the phonology, that. you know, we often do a lot about how it feels in your mouth, you know, where the tongue is, where the teeth is, how your lips are, and that's all multi-sensory as well. So, um, and if, they, if they're struggling with the ear, um, then actually this is a great way of trying to help them, so. But maybe I'm wrong, who knows? <laughs> I'm a bit nervous now. <laughs> no, and I'm really interested, I think we can let the panel come in, the researchers come in and um, comment, but one of my thoughts around that also is that um, active learning, um, has quite a lot of evidence to be quite powerful and I've often found and I'm really interested in what the researchers think of this but one or two of the neuromyths have what you might consider to be catalytic validity so a teacher thinks the wrong thing but it then leads to perhaps better teaching practice so I yeah. just want to throw that bombshell to our um yeah. our speakers to perhaps come back at I'd, I'd um, be here I'd be really learning. interested to hear what Vegeta hears about that as well because I call that double downing where and I'm not sure why I call it double downing but it, it's like you hear a myth so you stop doing stuff mm. um so you know you hear there's no visual learners so you stop doing visuals but if you go around my this special school here there's visuals everywhere and we wouldn't cope without visuals so so you know so you kind of have that myth that can then suddenly pick, everyone says right oh okay we don't need to use visuals anymore yes you do yeah, yeah. so I think there's <laughs> you know, some so, nuances yeah. that I am yeah absolutely to hear from our presenters in a moment yeah but perhaps Vegeta perhaps you'd be kind enough to come in on this one with us yeah, I agree with Jules and um when it's following the conversation as well I think there's an element that teachers take into account that has to do with the engagement into the learning opportunity and then the strategies that are used for the pedagogical approach. And uh, similar to what Jules just described, sometimes that consistency with those visual elements is preparing that young person or that child to be able to feel confident to engage with a very challenging learning opportunity, but it's not at the heart of the pedagogical approach. And we've found this a really interesting journey, um, certainly for those educators that we've supported through our teaching school, um, because of course, where the myth becomes something that's top down and becomes a whole school approach, it's almost taking that agency away from the teachers to really reflect on if I observe this child and I'm observing these in these aspects of my classroom environment, actually uh, where there is a neuromyth sitting there on what this may be in relation to uh, the sort of complexity of the profile of need, it has a completely different role in terms of how they're going to be able to have uh, those small steps of confidence, build them up to be able to engage in that more challenging space. Mm -hmm. And that's because often those teachers have worked closely with the families to be able to take that into account in the home environment. So uh, yes, exactly as Jules sort of described also, 
don't want to suggest that uh, what I'm sharing is lock stock across, you know, education in all schools, but I, I would sort of follow it up with the sense that there's a lot of interest and thirst in the sector where teachers want to mm -hmm. ask those questions and they really want to grapple with them. And that's the exciting part of what the Center for Educational Neuroscience is providing us that that first slide on the conduit about the discussion between education and neuroscience actually for asking those burning questions. Uh, it does start to potentially uh, open up quite important debates on those neuromyths as well. Yeah. So shall we let our researchers in to tell us whether we're clinging, resisting <laughs> um, uh, research or whether there's a nuance here? So maybe Joe could um, come in first. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, Jill, thanks. Um, and both Fujita, thank you very much for good observations. And I think it is indeed around, we're not saying that all of these neuromyths that we kind of are clear around you know, where they're positioned and because there's not always a lot of evidence yet in terms of special educational needs around what's true for all children and what works for which children. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a multi-sensory approach, we do know that, and it's around indeed, as Jules was saying, it's around providing it at the same time. We're not saying that, you know, yeah, don't yeah. Provide it several times. Problem with doing things with, this, with a survey rather than maybe a focus group where you can flesh out the definitions a little bit more. Um, but it is indeed around, you know, what works for which children. And it's kind of this idea maybe that some people may have. It's like, well, you know, if, if they've got problems with understanding, if we provide, you know, the text and we provide some oral or we do always pictures. And, and I think the point is that, well, it may not always be pictures that help, especially if they're very colorful and may actually detract attention away from what the student needs to listen to. Um, but I think this is again, what, the, what we need to do more is, is have these debates between um, researchers and educators around terminology and what's a multi-sensory approach you know what what do how do we see this as a researcher how do educators see that and then more research around knowing what works for for which children but I'm sure you know Michael might have some some other uh, or additional ideas to that. <laughs> thank you Joe thank you Michael yes I same as Joe, I think it's really important for, for, for you to come back at us and say, what the heck do you mean by multi-sensory? <laughs> and and really, for me, that, that is the dialogue. And, and there is a lot of basic research, uh, but sometimes the communication is, is um, difficult because we use the same words to mean different things. So mm. I, I'll take the biggest example of all, learning. Mm. So educationally, a child who learns comes out with new skills from before they went into the class, right? Uh, from a neuroscientist, that's at least eight different systems in the brain mm -hmm. and changing the strength of connections between neurons. And, you know, that's why a, a, a neuroscientist may say, oh, there's one system for learning facts and here's this other system for learning skills. And then what we might be asking, which, which, for which one of those types of learning is sleep more important? Which type of, if you're deprived mm -hmm. sleep, do you have problem learning skills or problems learning facts? So we, we need all of those distinctions in research in order to ask our precise questions, but it, but it can make the communication difficult. And that's why we need these kind of conversations to, to work out when we're using these words, what, what do we mean by them? I do like the idea of, of catalytic validity. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and one of the interesting things is, is that, that neuromyths aren't spontaneous. They, there, there's a seed of truth in, in many of them. So even 10% uh, of the brain, um, it's, it's possible that at any one time, about 10% of the neurons are firing. If all your neurons fired at once, pop, right? So 10% uh, active at any one time, but a different 10% depending on the moment you look at it, right? So they're, they're all seeds of truth for that. And it's this kind of discussion about, well, well which parts of these ideas are true and, and Really, it's to try and um, empower teachers to, to be able to find out where the evidence is on these things. And I think that's the responsibility of researchers, not to say, well, read all the science papers, but to be able to summarize the current state of the research in a way that teachers can access to, to enable teachers to work out for themselves, well, which of these ideas are going to work for me in my classroom. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Michael. So I'm just going to ask the panel an extension to that question. Do you think there have been changes to the types of neuromyths that you've seen in teachers? 
um, that the type of neuromedicine teacher has been holding. Do you think there's been any particular differences in terms of key stage or in different subject areas? And do you think children hold the same types of neuromyth or do you think there's a, a difference? And, and don't judge me on my teaching inability, the fact that I've asked four questions in one. So <laughs> I'm taking the license of being a panelist here. Uh, if I maybe set the scene for Jules, because uh, um, the, the national curriculum, the, the flexibility that school leaders now have to be able to consider curriculum intent, what that offer is, the way that the accountability system that's in England is actually shifting as well, um, actually means that there's much more uh, flexibility for that personalized model on what this curriculum offer is, what it's gonna develop for pupils um, and the characteristics they'll grow once they leave that next phase of learning or enter the next phase of learning. So I think there's an element here that also um, brings up unknowns because this idea of there are schools that don't work in a key stage model. Uh, some schools don't have to follow particular subjects in the way that other schools do. Um, and there's that personalized consideration on it as well. So. The curious question for me, uh, probably back to um, our, our colleagues is, how are we gonna identify potential myths that could develop? Because there's certainly a reduction in subjectivity. Uh, mm -hmm. Schools are working as networks, they're collaborating. There's a big push for research coming into the classroom. Uh, what is, how could schools now bring some of those questions back? to um, that educational neuroscience piece, because I certainly don't have a straightforward answer to this um, personally, but that's because we find it quite exciting that so many schools are choosing to really say, this is our non-negotiable priority for these children and young people. And because of that, they're taking the driving seat from their point of learning, which is, feels like quite a positive uh, in, in my opinion. So some really interesting themes from there. One of them is about the conduit from practitioners in schools to researchers about answering questions that are really emerging. And I think another point that you made, which I think is really interesting, is that schools operate less and less in isolation. So it may well be that we can diffuse neuromyths more quickly. However, it may also be that there are other types of neuromyths that can spread more quickly because they're popular in that dump school network. So mm -hmm. some, a couple of really interesting points there. Lovely, thank you. Um, I, I was going to say, um, that was really interesting actually what Patricia was saying, because, and I think I was thinking about the early career, career framework as well. Mm -hmm. So our new teachers now, uh, it's a two year um, program. So we've just been involved with UCL actually on um, the early career framework. And there's lots of opportunity there to get um, to discuss neuromyths. Um, so, so I thought that was interesting. Um, with regards to key stage and subject, there's quite a lot, I think, of difference between, say, English and math. So, so math mastery is really um, taken off in this country at the moment. And so and math mastery is that idea that, you know, everybody is at the same level. And that's a very different mindset um, for us, I think, people that work in SEND, you know, so um, and they're sort of they're not allowed to move on until they've got to that mastery level and then move on. And so when you start talking about these spiky profiles, I'm one of those, um, that, that's quite a, quite a one to get over because you might be really good on that bit, but not good on that bit. And if you can't get past that bit, then you never find that bit. So I think that would be an interesting myth to look at. Um, with regards to children, I think sometimes they do have the same myths, but sometimes they don't actually understand their diagnosis either. So, you know, we have lots of children here that um, have dyslexia, ADHD, autism, um, and I don't, you know, we, we try to talk to them, you know, that sort of, I think metacognition comes in there too, you know, when we talk about that. And um, I think there, there could be something quite nice on the research level to show what is appropriate for children to know about their own diagnosis um, to get rid of those myths as well. Because, um, you know, you could have a very child-friendly neuromyth um, idea, which I would love the idea of. I think that would be great. Yeah. 
No, that's really interesting. And thinking about neuromyths for children, many children tell me that they really like their coloured overlays. Yes. And I've often reflected on this. And I wonder whether it's because the teacher's spending a bit of time with them. Maybe there's a dialogue that happens while they have the overlay and maybe that helps with the decoding. But it's, sometimes we seem to get a bundle um, a combination so it's not the overlay that's making the difference but it is the fact that the teacher has thought about them and maybe um, Michael were thinking back about catalytic validity because perhaps the teacher that's provided the overlay also always has sharp pencils and has chosen texts that are the correct um, reading age for that child so I think there's something really interesting here about the specificity of research and how it can support the more multiplex complexity of the school environment so massive question there for our researchers so maybe i'll go straight to um, I'm just, i was going to mention those colors over if i may just say as well to add because i've had many a conversation with optometrists about this mm. and so and there's definitely something around you know um around visual perception or something yeah. you know which definitely isn't dyslexia but they might go hand in hand but there are children that mix their B's and D's up and there are children um, that, that do say the um, cut, cut. I've seen a child nearly fall off his chair when I put a coloured overlay on on a sheet because suddenly he said it's the first, you know, he didn't realise letters didn't move. So something yeah. is there. But I know that that I'm actually embedding the myth now because yeah. but I always try to say that's not dyslexia, you know, but yeah. and I would say what if, you know, it's 25p for an overlay. So why are we going to stop children using them if they say that they help, even if it is a holistic um, approach so I have a big thing about that one <laughs> so it, it's our job to challenge our researchers so yeah, um, let's yeah. throw, throw throw the ball to Michael and then Joe. <laughs> Shall I go first? Because uh, yes. I think one of the important points I was made is around indeed comorbidities. And I think, again, that is one that is not really well understood in terms of, you know, when things work for children, how, you know, the way we label children already is difficult. The way diagnoses are made can vary very much depending on local authority or who makes the diagnosis. And then as well, we need to work, work on, you know, what works for which child. So again, you know, that this is where there might be something, as Jules was saying, that goes hand in hand with, you know, dyslexia being more likely to have uh, visual difficulties. Although we know from the research that that's not always the case, right? So, yeah. And we are also illustrating, I think, how myths become so pervasive. Mm -hmm. So sometimes one gets very fond of something and then one skews one's observational evidence to fit that um, that, that belief. So I, I think the whole domain around um, the pervasiveness of myths and the embeddedness of myths is a really interesting one as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree on that. Mm. You get wedded to ideas, don't you? It's very hard to break them. <laughs> Michael, did you want to come in here? Yeah, no, I mean, I've just endorsed many of the things that have been said. It's, it's really tricky to work out what works because we are not objective. And when we have a pet idea, we are kind of confirmatory about seeking out evidence. And then there are things that can trick us. So I'll give you an example about dyslexia. We think the problem is phonology, but there's some famous research that shows playing action video games makes you better at uh, reading accuracy. OK, uh, and it's like uh, video games. That's kind of a visual thing. Um, and we now know that the action video games are improving your top-down attentional control of your visual system. But all of this is playing to a story that, that if your phonology is struggling, it, it appreciates being helped out by better visual input, right? So just because a visual aid can help doesn't mean that, that, that that's undermining that the main cause is, is a phonological one. So it's because of these you know, distractions, the fact that it's very hard to, to be uh, uh, impartial objective in, in working out what's working in, in front of you. That's why we need the evidence basis, right? Uh, but even that, we, we have struggles in, in, in research about, do we run these big randomized control trials? Uh, I mean, they, they take a long time to run and generally they find uh, very small effects. Um, uh, and yet we know that, that if you put a lot of resources into a struggling child, uh, you can get big effects. And, and really, it turns out to be a difference between 
uh, understanding whether something works, some technique works, versus getting it to work where you really, you, you just want to throw every resource you can afford at the child. Uh, and who cares which one's having the effect as long as there's improvement. So, so the researchers are trying to titrate all these different effects, but really we want a maximum outcome for each individual child. Thank you very much, absolutely fascinating. So I'm now going to move to a question for the panelists about different types of resources. So what resources are most helpful to you within the school setting to support teachers and dispel these neuromyths? And what resources would you like to see? I have to go first, Vegeta. <laughs> Lovely. Um, following you. I suppose the uh, and it's it's also uh, you know uh, Jules is a, a strong voice on social media, so I'd say you're with with colleagues that feel our responsibility to the system as well. Um, but the key thing is that um, there's if I gave the example of the Chartered College of Teaching, just one example. But you know it's an organization that is wanting to mobilize this sort of desire from teachers to really have agency. So they're putting the research at their fingertips. All of their membership uh, interacts with that. There's such a systemic option there for rolling out those neuro myths to teachers, whether they're early career teachers or very experienced. Um, there's so many collaboratives of schools as well. Um, that isn't led by head teachers. Actually, it's collaboratives of teachers together as peers, seeing that they want to remove some of the subjectivity, open up that debate, uh, really explore those next steps. Um, so I think that there are so many different avenues to be able to move it forward. It's not really about an individual uh, sort of approach. But for us, uh, we're probably the majority, you're the minority. So I think if you we're able to know that you've got two volunteers right here who would happily give you uh, the blueprint and an analysis of what the system has to offer. Um, I think we have some responsibility in creating some of those connections so that we can get it out. Um, because actually the moment we get that, that first set out, the conversation comes back to you from how they've interacted and what questions it poses for those next steps. If I've interpreted your question correctly, Amelia. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Um, I also, what really came across for me there, Vegeta, was the importance of working with stakeholders such as yourselves at making sense of the research findings. So something may have come out from a piece of research, but unleashing it into the world without it being um, in some way stress tested, thinking about Michael's point about thinking about the different types of vocabulary and um, what the definitions are. It seems to be really important to make sense of research findings within a um, safe setting so that we can think about what the implications would need to be in schools. I think what's quite nice at the moment in schools is that um, teachers are very much not trying to look for summative uh, sort of uh, sort of examples. They're not trying to find the, the magic wand as well. Uh, there's such a case study model where actually you do, do feel teachers as action researchers because they're coming together as groups to share in this circumstance with this profile, as Joe said, this comorbidity we're starting to find other schools that have pupils with the comorbidity profile at our school because we're just one school, but once we connect with 40 others, we're able to see some of those trends that we're encountering as educators. And we need that mass to be able to really hold ourselves to account on, are we asking ourselves the right questions about curriculum, pedagogy, are we assessing appropriately as well? Um, and that objectivity that comes through those networks of schools, if the you know, the research is sitting there, uh, everyone's desire is to find it, but if we found a way to uh, really be able to feed back from that piece of research, this is what as a group of teachers we're encountering, and these are the questions that come through that or our observations, and being able to send that back. Again, it's that back and forth sort of dialogue that allows the research to translate into practice. And I think that's exactly right. And that's the power of these neurosense seminars, which are um, triggering the focus group. So this is all about the initiating of some very important two way dialogue. Brilliant. Thank you. Jules, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I'm, I was really I completely agree with everything. Uh, Vegeta's saying there about you know there's there's a thirst on social media um, mm -hmm. to find the facts. I've had 
Great, and and what I love about Twitter is you get you get to speak to you know I've had conversations with Dor uh, Professor Bishop about developmental language disorder, and you know so you get to reach some really quite the, the best in the field in the research, so that's lovely. Um, I know Bram Norwich is um, in Exeter. He has the Send Forum, which is for Senkos. That's been really powerful. Um, so a sort of research version of that for Sends would be really useful because I think what I have found with the research sometimes it's very mainstream school and then actually the myths that they're sometimes busting um, are irrelevant for um, SEN or sometimes damaging to children in SEN and mainstream schools so that sort of inclusive education um, they start you know saying differentiation doesn't matter visuals don't matter and everybody should be taught the same in 30 in a class and you know we're seeing more exclusions from that which is why i've been so passionate about exclusion for children with send so i think there needs to be something that is that concentrates on send no i think that's absolutely right and this actually leads me to a really good point because matthew's just put in the chat that he'd like to take some questions from the audience and there have been some really great questions so i'm just going to take a slightly back seat here and let matthew take over sorry yes yeah, interrupt this um very nice conversation so we've got a poll to run as well so um for everybody all the audience we're going to run a, another poll now let me just get it up and relaunch polling um so it says if i relaunch polling it will clear the existing results that sounds bad doesn't it <laughs> huh? That's scary yeah hang on okay it should be fine because it should only be for for our practice yeah okay yeah. Continue. Okay, so the second poll is up. If you'd like to have a look at that, um, and we'll, there's only a few questions. If you could put your answers in, and then we'll move on to some questions from the audience as well. Uh, and to do so, you need to click the polls button at the bottom. Okay, so while people are doing that, I can um, ask some questions. So there's quite a lot of questions here. So Joy Hunt um, is asking, and this is for anybody on the panel, I think, but it'd be interesting to hear what uh, the different perspectives that teachers and researchers have on this. So is asking, uh, what are your thoughts about the strengths profile view of SEN? That dyslexic people make good architects people with ADHD are good entrepreneurs, et cetera. Mm. You know, is, is um, perhaps, Jules, would you like to? Well, yeah, uh, this comes, uh, I have two things on that. One, I think sometimes the world of SEN is a slight deficit um, model. So the word disorder, for instance, um, teachers are very uncomfortable with, and yet it's in the research world. Um, you know, they much prefer difference or uh, difficulty um, because they're dealing with those children. So trying to say to a child they have a disorder is really hard so uh, just just to um say even that is 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 quite tricky um but i do believe there's a bit of a myth as well around um dyslexia and people with adhd they do often um are big characters um, often in schools but i'm not sure if they are compared to other children without SEN. So I think that is one of those possible myths, but the strength base is useful because otherwise these children feel they're, you know, they're, they're not succeeding in schools because everything, um, there's so many barriers for them in schools that I think it's really important to say to them that, you know, you have loads of strengths and actually our EPs, our educational psychologists are now basing their reports on strengths um, far more than, than their difficulties. And I endorse that, you know, completely. Matt, can I come in here? There's actually some really good research evidence for using strengths as well. So if you look at Williams syndrome, I know it's a rare genetic syndrome, but they're very good. They have very good memory, auditory memory, and also are very musical in terms of their like music. And there's new 
there's now some evidence to suggest that actually musical therapy using music can help them to memorize things, learn new things, learn sequencing, uh, and helps with uh, also attention, etc. So again, using the strengths to overcome some of our difficulties, um, as now there's some evidence to uh, back that up. Um, shall I show the results of this poll? Because only I can see at the moment, it's quite interesting. Uh, so end polling, share results. So can everybody see that now? Yes. So for the first question was, what, what is the most salient issues with regards to teaching? There seems to be an equal spread across learning and cognition, behavior, social difficulties. Um, what do you think would be most useful? Seems to be more of a bias towards kind of tips, but equally there's a kind of um, some appetite for understanding the causes and reasons. And this one would be very pleasing to, to Michael. Do you think there should be a course on brain functions? Um, a resounding yes for that one. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for taking part in that poll. Um, stop sharing results. So let's move on to another question. Um, so um, Robert is asking, do you think the children who are looked after with special educational needs have additional challenges to get educationalists to engage with them? And perhaps um, what kind of approaches might support those additional challenges if there are? Uh, I know, uh, Amelia, you've done some work in this area, I think, haven't you? Or you yes, um, yes, I, I've been running the Knowledge Exchange Programme promoting the achievement for looked after children. Um, I would say that bringing in the legislation around virtual schools and um, the designated teachers who have an overview of looked after children was a game changer. So I think that made a, 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 a significant difference to there being a story holder within schools, thinking about the right amount of information, who needed to know what, in what format, and young people having a much greater voice. So my immediate thought is I think we've made great strides in that direction. And I can see that Vegeta very much has something here to say. Just that um, it's, I think that there is such a strength now in schools on that multi-agency working and those pupils that um, are looked after children. There's a nice sort of, uh, sort of element in the system at the moment on trying to avoid that label defining uh, what their uh, sort of trajectory will be as well, so that it's able to really think about where they are, but also how these relationships that are very much in the school, which is their safe sort of nurturing environment, are going to be able to think beyond that phase of education so that we can also support those children to be able to know that that relationship that they've managed to take that step and trust is one that they'll follow through even if there's a, a change and a shift. Um, so the virtual role that uh, Amelia has described is one aspect, um, but also how we're able to very much see that I think education's got quite good answers sitting there, but how they're able to make sure that multi-agency approach is at the heart of it. I think the labeling side is, it's a complexity, but um, what it means for schools to be able to ensure they're holding themselves to account to make sure that there's a visibility to that child uh, is one factor. How it labels the child and uh, might sort of define who they are in a class group is a secondary one. So I think it's important to see it from two different directions so that the child themselves can define their identity through that process also. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that or should we move to another question? Um, so, Donna Lynn Shepherd is asking, um, what do you think the biggest risks of neuromyths held by those working in education or just in the general public might be? Um, Joe, do you want to? Yeah, I'd like to come in there. Yeah, um, I think there's two things. One of them, which I mentioned, is stigma. So around, you know, these general beliefs that, you know, children with autism or autistic children, they have no interest in social relationships. And actually, 
we know that one of the things they're they're most distraught about is you know when there's when there's a social breakdown in terms of relationships or someone's upset with them it really upsets them just you know for many of them and um, so I think it's the stigma in terms of outcomes I think that the, the biggest one is there are certain neuromyths related to well you know we know that these children have impairments disorders as Jill said you know these big words that we don't like in education where it then goes like well so you know they're not going to be able to learn maths if you've got dyscalculia we might as well give up and if you've got dyslexia well you know they're never going to be good at reading so you know some progress and and I think it lowers I think there's a danger here where we lower expectations of what children can achieve rather than maybe thinking around okay well probably our usual methods where we teach might not work what other ways can we think around making sure these children achieve their what I like to use to always say is you know their maximum potential and and really use that potential and get the potential out there and I think that's the biggest risk at neuromyths and there are a number of them like you know children with down syndrome have smaller brains they're not going to be able to learn because let's not forget it's not around so much what the myths themselves say but then what the consequence in terms of your other beliefs in terms of what you didn't think that might mean for education for development i think that's a really important point from joe so it's the myth and its potential impact and and the the potential for harm that it can 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 do thank you as, as a panel convener, I'm just mindful that we're about four minutes to 6.30. So does anybody in our audience have a burning question that they feel has not been adequately answered? If they do, they can raise their hand and we can see it. And then maybe these people can mute themselves when, you know, if, if we've got time to select them. So we have quite a few questions in the box so we, could, we could take one more of those perhaps and then yes yes yeah, should we do that, that? sounds good okay um so this is uh specific um for, for michael i noticed you mentioned the neuromyth of poor theory of mind being used as an autistic diagnostic tool how much impact do you feel um, that Damien Milton's work on double empathy has. I don't know if you know of that work, um, or perhaps others in the in the in the panel might um, know of that work and could could start us off on that at all. Yes, yeah, so I, I already responded to one of the, the questions in the box about that. So I I, I gave the the theory of mind uh, example in in autism as as a kind of historical example of the kinds of things that that have uh, been generated by researchers in the in the, in the history of, of uh, uh, basic research on developmental disorders. But um, things have certainly moved forward and certainly within a, a, a kind of neurodiversity perspective, we're now thinking in terms of a kind of um, uh, some of the difficulties coming from a misalignment uh, between social partners in, in interactions, rather than thinking in this kind of deficit model as there's, there's something broken. Uh, and, and thinking in, in these kind of neurodiverse ways about how both social partners can adapt and, and you, can, you can solve the communication issues uh, because of that. So certainly I, I think that the new work that's looking uh, at the, the kind of social deficits within a, a broader uh, perspective of social interaction is a, is a good, good step and advance in that area. Lovely, thank you. We have two minutes left, so I'm just wondering if Joe, Michael, Jules and Vegeta would, would, would sign us off with one crucial message. Perhaps Matthew could join in on that as he's part of the research team. So what would you like colleagues to go away with as a result of this session? So one sentence from each of you. I'd well, quite like to just, um, sorry, I'd just quite like to share that, that um, the, the neuromyths, I, I absolutely welcome this. I think it, it, it's great. Um, but the, the personal child and the individual child is really important as well. And I just wanted to share about one of our children. Um, he's been campaigning to watch World Wide Wrestling, which he's not allowed to do in our school at the moment. And he's been protesting around the school with leaflets. And um, when we've told him he's not allowed to, he said he's like a suffragette. <laughs> and, uh, and he will he will conquer. 
<laughs> and so I just want to say th those lovely stories about these, you know, the, these children and, and, they, and not to forget the child, I think, and when we start talking about, um, you know, the miss, which, which I, nobody has here, definitely. But, but that's my message, I think. Thank you. Lovely. Vegeta, a, a concluding sentence. I suppose for me, it's um, us remembering as educators that uh, we can be sold ideas, they can be very convincing, but if we think about whatever comes our way, the application of that in terms of thinking about different components to the engagement with learning process of learning, because we are designers of learning, uh, and then challenging ourselves to really reflect around, uh, is there research that I can explore in order to assess my reflections? And uh, I've got to say, I, I checked all of the links. The, the Center for Educational Neurosciences website is quite easy and accessible. So, and the, the articles are written in a way that help us think about, ooh, is that a myth? And if it is a myth, um, interacting with a very sort of simple article, there's so many resources there. So. Um, us holding on to there, there really is not a very one size fits all model or strategy that's going to work. It's about that relationship with the pupils and the research can really underpin how we unlock their potential and their engagement in that learning journey. Uh, if we're able to sort of uh, integrate that reflective inquiry with the educational neuroscience at the heart of it. Thank you for promoting the Centre for Neuroscience website. Your check will be in the post. <laughs> Thank you. Matthew. Um, I think my comment would be more related to, to this kind of event and is, is more to researchers really um, with the message of um, engaging with teachers and speaking to teachers and asking what these kind of quite abstract things that come up in the research look like in the real complex, real life world of the classroom. I think it's so important to, to kind of have that dialogue and, and, and um, understand what, what it's like in the classroom and for the children, I think. Brilliant, yeah. thank you, Matthew. Michael. Yeah, I'm gonna complain that, that Matthew stole my lines there. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I just wanna endorse that. I'm really keen as a researcher to hear more about what things are like in the classroom for different types of kids and, and both to help me direct further research and think about of, of what we currently do know, how might that be useful? Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. And Joe, if you would kindly sign us off. Oh, great. Well, thank you all very much for being here. But before you go, we still have a few polls, if that's OK, before we go. So before I sign off, but I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Um, obviously, both uh, Matt and Michael have stolen my line, too. But actually, I want to go a little bit further than that. And really, I think what we do is what we need is we need as researchers more help with the translational aspect. So yes, the website is there and there's some great resources, but how do we make sure that teachers know about this? Because it's not only about us producing materials based upon the questions we get from research, from teachers. I mean, we, and really all of the questions we have in the Q and A, we'll try and answer them and get back and think around how we develop those into materials. But then we develop the materials and the next question is, how do you find out about them? So I think going home tonight, or you're already at home probably, seeing where we are, um, but you know, tonight, think a little bit more around, okay, how do we do this? How do we make some noise around it? Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. And so Matt, can you launch the polls? And Launch the last poll, yes. Yeah, so this is, everything's good in threes. This is the third poll. So if you open up the poll section now, and I'll relaunch polling, continue. So if you could add your thoughts to that. Um, and whilst you're doing that, I'd just like to thank all of our uh, panelists today, Vegeta, Amelia and Jules for a really fascinating discussion and Michael and Joe for the presentations. We will put the recordings of this online um, on the Centre for Educational Neuroscience website and we'll send around a email with the recordings um, possibly the slides and maybe some further reading as well um, to everybody who's registered. If you're interested in taking part in some of the further activities that we're going to be doing in, in terms of the focus groups, we'd really love to hear from you and we'll be putting um, a link to that into the email we'll send around as well. But um, thank you very much everybody for attending and okay. thank you to all our panellists.